Hey, thanks everybody. Um, I am Dane. Uh, welcome to the second slot in Pi Ohio. Um, so first, before I start talking, I have a little survey I want to do just to kind of get a sense of who I'm talking to. So uh, can you raise your hand if you've written unit tests before? Okay, that's a good at all. Um, and keep your hands up. Uh, and put your keep your hand up if you've uh, if you regularly write unit tests. <laughs> okay, I knocked out a bunch of you. Uh, keep your hand up if you regularly, or I should say, have an automated system that runs them. Uh, okay, some people put their hands up after that. Um, so, uh, and and who's written any tests with PyTest before? A couple of you. Okay, good. So uh, this talk will. Uh, not go over too many of the fundamentals of unit testing, uh, and it will talk about unit test a little bit and PyTest a little bit, and then how to um, how to go about putting PyTest into your project. So uh, this is Adopt a PyTest. I'm Dane Hillard, and I'm a lead web application developer at Ithaca, um, and I'm easy as Python on Twitter, and that'll be on the slides throughout the talk. So. Uh, you don't have to screenshot it desperately right away uh, or anything like that. Um, so who am I? A little bit about me. Um, and yeah, so we're going to go through uh, who I am and then some reasons to PyTest and how to do it. And then if we have some time, a uh, few more reasons that I like PyTest. So I've been developing Python for about seven years now, most of that time also with Django. Uh, and then I've recently been doing web app development, uh, and so I've been doing a little bit more front-end stuff as well, uh, but using Django and Python to support a lot of that. And I do a lot of hobby stuff, uh, and I'd love to talk to you about any of these after this. Um, so I do photography, I'm a musician, I've, done, I've been in a death metal band, uh, and I am now do mostly like acoustic folk stuff. Uh, I like to cook and I like to learn about food. I'm a competitive ballroom dancer. I actually have danced at the convention center here in Columbus a few times. Um, and uh, I like to write, so I do a lot of blogging. And um, I am an author, which uh, is what I'm kind of spending a lot of time, free time doing now. Um, so I'm writing this book, Practices of the Python Pro. Um, it's kind of an introduction to software design and collaborative development for people either new to Python or new to software um, and maybe looking to supplement their work in another field with software, things like that. So uh, my publisher has been kind enough to give a code for 40% off not just my book, but like any of their books in their catalog. Uh, so if you would like 40% off a book, there's a code. Um, and I'm happy to, to share that with you after this too. So um, that's a good deal. And I work at Ithaca, and that is a nonprofit organization centered around higher education. Um, and they offer a kind of a variety of products. Uh, art Store is a database for art history. Ithaca SNR does uh, consulting for uh, curriculum and things like that. JSTOR is a database for journals for academic research. Uh, and Portico does long term digital preservation of print documents. Um, so they have kind of a variety of things, and the goal is to promote higher education and learning. Um, and I work at JSTOR specifically, or work on JSTOR specifically. Um, and so Python for us at JSTOR looks like this. We have about 50 applications running in production. Um, and those consist of 900 or so Python modules, in addition to 300 or so test modules, which kind of rolls up to 2,000 tests or so. Um, and before, meaning maybe six months ago, um, we were often manually running those tests um, and only occasionally manually running those tests. Uh, and as a result, a lot of them were broken um, and sort of unmaintained. Um, and that wasn't a very good story for us. So we've recently invested some time getting those back up and running. Um, and now we're in a place where they're automated, which is sort of for our core applications. We still have a couple stragglers. Um, but those tests run on every commit. And as a result, they're not broken because we have to make them pass to, uh, to deploy code. So 
uh, it's a lot better picture. Uh, our team on JSTOR, there, there's several teams. Each one has two or three, sometimes four developers, but maybe depending who you, who you count or who you ask, um, I guess working on Python, there's probably about 12 or so developers along with QA and, and all that. So um, not a huge team, but not small either. Um, so what is PyTest? Uh, one of the major things that I like about it is that it offers a simpler syntax for writing your tests. Um, and this ultimately results in shorter and often more readable code, which I like. So here is kind of the minimal unit test you could write using the unit test framework. So you know you import your unit test module and then you write a class that subclasses unit test dot test case. And then within that class, you can write several functions that start with test underscore. Uh, and they generally just set up a precondition, take some action, and assert some post condition. Um, so this given when then, or maybe you've heard uh, arrange, act, assert, um, those are sort of the common, common ways to think about functional tests. Um, and so what's interesting here is that most of this code is not stuff that is doing your testing. Really the, the last, just the last part there with the, the method defined is, is what your test is. So there's a little bit of boilerplate involved. And uh, inside those tests when you want to actually make your assertions, uh, these are some of the options available, right? So uh, that test case class has these different methods for doing assertions. So you have assert equal, which will just compare the two values that you pass it assert is none, so you can check if result is a, a none type or something else. And then maybe you want to check that some value is in a collection of other values, so you can do assert not in. And these <laughs> kind of bother me, they always have, uh, because they don't really follow the kind of expression syntax you'd be used to writing in your actual implementation, right? So you often want to say actual double equals expected, or result is none, or needle not in haystack. Um, but when you write these unit tests, you kind of have to take the middle part of that syntax and extract it off to the left. And then you pass it these arguments, and sort of as you scan across the line, you have to remember what the assertion was you were making, and then read the arguments and decide in your brain which order they were supposed to be in. And it's, it's just kind of hard to do some of those mental gymnastics. So uh, as you compare this to PyTest, uh, you can write a PyTest test by just writing a function. Um, it starts with test underscore still uh, and still has that given when then structure. Um, but in some of the simplest cases, you don't need any boilerplate uh, around your test. So you can just kind of get right to writing it. And, and as you're reading tests, you can also just scan them pretty easily. And when you make assertions, Lo and behold, they look like the code you're used to writing, um, but they have an assert in front. So any expression that evaluates to a truthy or falsy value, you can just assert that that thing is what you want it to be. Um, so I, I like PyTest a lot because it corresponds quite nicely to your implementation code, the, the style that you write your implementation code in. And Another great feature that PyTest offers is this idea of fixtures. So in some of your more interesting unit tests, you may need to do some setup and teardown. So uh, you might need a database connection. So you can set that up at the beginning of your, of your tests. And then in your test, you can use that database connection to do uh, some action and, and assert something. And then after the test, you tear it down by closing that database connection. Um, so we don't, there's, there's still a lot of boilerplate surrounding this, um, but the setup and teardown are kind of what's interesting here. And in PyTest, this looks like this. So you can see that this uh, DB function is here and it's decorated with PyTest.fixture. And that means that this function DB is a dependency for some of your tests. Uh, you use it to, to 
do some setup and teardown for your tests. And it does something quite similar to the setup and teardown from the unit test. So you create a connection. And then uh, what's interesting then is that you yield that connection back to the execution of the test. Uh, and then after uh, the test is done executing, it goes back into that fixture and does the cleanup with connection.close. So I really like this because it kind of brings all the logic of the database connection dependency into one single function. And uh, it, it just feels more cohesive. Um, and it, you can kind of think of it like a, like a context manager in that regard. Um, so the test then takes in db, uh, the function handle, as, a, as an argument. And PyTest will automatically sort of connect the two. Um, you don't have to specify exactly where DB is coming from. DB could live in another file, uh, another module, and you wouldn't have to import it necessarily. Um, you can just say that your test depends on the DB fixture, uh, and then you can use the, the connection as you did before. So that's pretty great. Um, and fixtures, similarly to uh, unit tests set up class, uh, can also be scoped to a class. But in addition, they can also be scoped to the module that they're in, uh, as well as the entire test session. So if you have a really expensive fixture that's really t uh, expensive to set up, you can scope it to the session and just set it up once and then tear it down after the, the entire session is done. So fixtures are really powerful. And they also are composable. So uh, you can create some fixture for some data and then another fixture for some other data and then create a fixture that composes those two in some way um, just by depending on the fixture. Um, and then your test code will depend on the composed data fixture and get the benefits of all of those. Um, so you can mix and match them just as much as you like. It is. Yep. Um, the next thing I really like about PyTest is marks and patterns and filtering. So you can do things like pytest.mark.slow, uh, and slow can be anything you like it to be. Uh, it's sort of a label for that test, and it's, in this case, marking this test as slow. So this test takes a while to run for some reason. And you can tell PyTest, hey, don't run anything that's slow. Um, and this, this expression is pretty powerful. It supports some more interesting syntax. So here you would be trying to run only things that are not slow or not expected failures, for instance. Um, so you can, you can mix and match these expressions as well. Uh, it's sort of a, each, each label you can kind of think of as a Boolean. So if a test is labeled with slow, it's true. Uh, and if it's not, it's false. Um, so this is essentially a Python expression that determines which labels to, to use for the PyTest run. Uh, and similarly, it can do pattern matching for test uh, functions. So if I have a uh, few functions that test transactions, uh, some of them might be e-commerce transactions, some of them might be database transactions. Uh, so there are different areas of the code base testing different things. So if I'm editing code in the e-commerce portion of the code base, um, and I only want to run those tests, I can say search for any tests that match the pattern e-commerce and transaction and run those, uh, or similarly for, for databases. So filtering is really great, too. Thanks. Um, and durations are also really cool, because you can tell Python, or, uh, you can tell PyTest, rather, to let you know what the slowest tests you have are. So if your test suite is taking a while, um, hey, PyTest, what are the 10 slowest tests? Uh, and it'll print out a list of them after it executes them. So here we had like a, a test that necessarily waits half a second because it's testing a read timeout for an HTTP call. Um, so it takes half a second. And there's a connect timeout test that takes a quarter of a second. So you can use that to kind of uncover the slowest parts of your test session and, uh, and really speed them up by looking at those tests and seeing if you can do something, maybe, maybe extract a fixture so that it only gets set up once per uh, test run or once per class, that kind of thing. 
and uh, it also parallels unit test for a lot of stuff. It has parallels for most unit test stuff. So uh, if you if you have like self dot assert raises in your tests, there's pytest dot raises. Um, so most of the most of the idioms you're used to in your unit test framework uh, have a parallel. So pytest is pretty great, uh, but it's it's kind of hard sometimes to plug a new framework into code you already have. But I don't think it's really too hard to get PyTest up and running. So uh, if you'll bear with me, we'll talk a little bit about kind of the steps to get that going. The first step, anytime you're making sort of a significant change like this, is to create a baseline, right? You want to be confident that as you make changes, those changes aren't negatively affecting your code. Um, so in this case, the thing you want to do is just run your existing test suite uh, with unit test. And you want to kind of take stock of how many tests there are and how many are passing, ideally all of them. Um, and then that will kind of just set you up so that as you introduce PyTest, you know that you aren't uh, s suddenly not running those tests or breaking some tests. And the first step is really just to install PyTest, uh, any, any way you're used to installing Python packages. And if you're running coverage with your unit tests, uh, I definitely recommend installing PyTest Cov right away as well. Um, gives you a nice integration with the coverage measurement. And step two really is just to run PyTest. Uh, you don't have to do anything else before you try this, which is pretty awesome. Um, so if you install PyTest in your project and run it, it should give you something pretty close to what you want in most cases, unless you're doing more complex things. So uh, if you aren't, if you haven't used PyTest before, here's an example output. Um, it just tells you that the session is starting. It prints some information about the platform that it's running on, so the version of Python, uh, the version of PyTest, and any of the plugins you might have installed. And then uh, it tells you which directory that it's running from. Um, you can kind of run in subdirectories in your project, so it'll tell you where the, the root of that is. And then uh, it tells you that it collected some number of tests. And then it prints, by default, each module of tests that it finds, and then a dot for each, each passing test that it finds within that module. And then over here on the right is just the uh, kind of overall progress of the test session. And at the end, it tells you, hey, 37 tests passed in under a second. And then if you're running it with coverage, uh, kind of a similar thing, except at the end, it'll, it'll print your coverage. Um, and what's interesting here, there's, there's something wrong. Did anyone notice anything, anything amiss in this slide or the previous one? He's got his hand up. He can, he can answer. What do you see? Yeah, so there's, there's code here that's not covered, um, and that so one reason I like using coverage, especially as I'm making changes, is that uh, it can kind of tell me if I am suddenly not covering all my code. Um, and in this case, did anyone notice that there's uh, no longer 47 tests passing? Yeah, so uh, if you go back, remember your baseline. Uh, we had 47 tests passing, and now we have 37 tests passing. And if you run with coverage, uh, you can might, if you expect the probability module to be fully covered, um, you would see this and say, wait, wait a minute, that's not supposed to be there. Um, and then you would look down here and see 37 tests passed. You're like, wait, did I, is that how many I had? I don't remember. Uh, so always write down that you had 47 tests passing. Um, and if you see it change, uh, you either need to be able to explain that change or uh, you've done something wrong. So uh, in this case, uh, after please, um, in this case, uh, we need to actually fix the test discovery. So each framework kind of has its own caveats and quirks about discovering tests. Uh, unit tests, by default, will find things like test star dot pi uh, and, and as following test underscore dot pi. Uh, and then it'll find things that subclass unit test. Test case uh, 
uh, and methods that start with test underscore. PyTest, on the other hand, uh, will not find things that just start with test. They have to start with test underscore, um, or they have to end with underscore test. Um, so make sure that you know what kinds of patterns your test framework will find. Um, there's other runners, right? There's like nose, there's several others, and they probably each are different. So uh, there's this big grid of, of what tests can find, <laughs> what tests those frameworks can find. Uh, and in this case, um, maybe we look and see that oh, test probability doesn't have an underscore in its name. Um, so one option, especially in this example, the easy option would be just like rename your test module, right? Um, renaming test probability to test underscore probability would not be an expensive operation. But if you have hundreds of test modules, um, that could be kind of a big pain, uh, especially if you have other reasons that your tests are named that way. So option B is to configure PyTest to be better about test discovery. Um, so there's this PyTest INI file, and it basically consists of a PyTest section and then a number of settings, uh, and one of those is called Python files, and you can basically pass it a list of file name patterns where it can find your tests. So I recommend as you first in introduce PyTest into your project, that you be very liberal with this list of, of patterns just to make sure that it's finding all of your tests. And then um, as you find maybe that you're not following an exact practice that you like, you can slowly rename those tests um, and then, and then uh, eventually remove this setting. So if we add that setting, we rerun with coverage. Now our project is fully covered again. And you can see that test probability.py uh, was now discovered by PyTest. So that's a good one to look out for. Um, and we have 47 passing tests again. So always look for your baseline. And then uh, the next step is to shim things. So in our projects, uh, we use Django. And there's this PyTest Django uh, plugin. And it provides a number of features for running tests with Django, one of which is that uh, by default, it will not give you access to the database. Um, and if you're used to running Django tests, that's kind of automatic and built into the normal Django test running. So um, when we first installed PyTest and PyTest Django, we had a number of tests fail because they said, I can't access the database. Um, so PyTest has this conftest.py file uh, that allows you to set up a number of things. You can use fixtures that you want to share across all of your tests or your, your whole test project. Uh, and what we did was basically create this enable DB access for all tests. And it depends on the DB fixture, which comes from PyTest Django. And then we told it auto use equals true, which means for every test uh, under the domain of this session, uh, automatically give access to the database. And only tests that need access will use it. Um, so it didn't necessarily slow anything down. Um, there may have been some overhead to setting that up, but um, what it allowed us to do is get back to all passing tests. Uh, and then as we went on, we marked each test that really needed access to the database with a specific mark for that. Uh, and then we were able to delete this fixture at the end. Um, but that's a good way to, to shim things in. Um, and then the, the last step kind of is to, the last, the last implementation step really is to use PyTests in your new tests. Um, so as you're writing new tests, you can use that simpler assert, in, assert syntax that we saw. Uh, you can use fixtures, you can use everything. So really just adopting and embracing what you've, what you've pulled in. Uh, and then eventually you can rewrite your old tests as well if you like uh, for consistent style or uh, maybe you have a few that are expensive and you can make them better by extracting fixtures and things like that. And then um, kind of a, a plus that I like is to use plugins that are helpful to you. So PyTest has a pretty rich ecosystem of plugins available already. Uh, and it's also a plugin-based architecture, which I'll talk about again in a sec. Um, so you can write your own plugins if you like. Um, and it integrates really nicely with continuous integration. Uh, if you're using Jenkins, PyTest can actually output in JUnit format and sort of natively plug into the Jenkins reporting. Um, so you get this nice graph that says how many tests you have over time. Thanks. And, uh, and what the status of those are. 
if they're all passing or, or some are failing or erroring out. Um, so the sort of the moral of the story here is that you can do this incrementally. You can sort of get PyTest installed and running and have your tests running under PyTest. And then you can slowly work to make it really efficient and clean and polished. And PyTest has a lot of helpful fallbacks. So it runs unit test tests by default um, and, and kind of does what you hope it might uh, in order to, to help you while you're sort of under construction. Um, and then adopt and embrace. So um, you can kind of realize the full power of PyTest over time after you've got it installed. Um, I have a little bit more time, so I'll talk about a couple other things that I like about PyTest. Um, parameterization. So here's a unit test test case. I don't know if you can read the code all the way in the back. Good? OK, cool. Um, so basically, imagine you have some search module, and uh, it has this query cleaner class that's uh, duty is to take search queries and turn them into a more kind of canonical form. Um, so if there's a bunch of spaces in the query, it'll strip all those out. If there's quotes and spaces, it'll strip those out as well. And then if there's any kind of uh, square brackets or curly braces, uh, it'll strip those out. And you have a, a test for each of those different cases, which is a pretty good practice that I like. Um, it's nice to have one assert per test often, uh, though it's not a hard, hard fast rule. So if you run that, uh, you have five passing tests, which is all great. Um, and then uh, if you wanted to make this code a little shorter, because it's pretty, it's pretty hefty, um, you could split those up kind of by the behavior that they represent. So you could have one test case for stripping out spaces and one for brackets. Um, and that would, I mean, that's a little bit more readable in my opinion. Uh, except that when you run it, now you only have two passing tests um, because you've only defined two test functions, two test methods. Um, so another way you could do this is to have a for loop with all of your inputs and expected outputs and then use subtest, uh, which is a feature of unit test. Um, and that's kind of nice because then you can just read all the inputs and outputs as a list. However, when you run that, you have one passing test. Um, because they're, those tests are really all subtests of your original test, uh, of the larger larger test. So in PyTest, uh, it actually looks quite similar um, to that subtest example, but you can run it and it'll give you five passing tests, which I like. Um, and if you run with a verbose on, it'll print sort of the inputs and output sets for each of those uh, test cases. So that's pretty cool. Um, like I said, it works with Jenkins, works with Tox. Um, it has a plugin based architecture. So there's a number of pretty cool plugins out there. Um, PyTest Cov, I've talked about. PyTest Django, I talked about. PyTest randomly will run your tests in a random order every time uh, to help you uncover cases where one test depended on another test running in a different order. Um, so we've uncovered a handful of problematic ones with that. Um, and I think it'd be cool to have a PyTest plugin that plays Tina Belcher panic noises until your tests are green. And that's all I have. Thank you.